The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Coffee with Coffee, uh, the November issue. Uh, I think a timely topic here, snow melt. In fact, I would imagine there's some people looking at snow outside their window as we speak today. So I think we got a great topic. we got a great presenter. And um, we don't really have a reference for a snow melt specifically, snow and ice melt. But uh, we thought maybe number 15 talks a little bit about separation, which uh, plays a part in piping systems like this together. I know Max has got some good uh, uh, slides of actual installations and boiler room piping. So I think you'll see how that kind of uh, plays into separation there, dirt uh, magnetic as well as hydraulic separation. So that's what we chose. And there's my boy. Um, I, I taught him everything I know about hydronics, but after watching this, obviously I didn't teach him everything he knows because I learned a lot watching this and I hope everybody else does too. So uh, proud to introduce my son, Max, to uh, take it away and teach us something. Thanks, Max. Great, yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I definitely love a good snow melt system and I've spent about 20 years of my life in either Utah or Colorado. So I've seen kind of the good, the bad and the ugly and I've also learned from some of the best in the industry as far as uh, proper uh, ways to assemble these systems and some tips and tricks. So I'll kind of go through that over the next hour. So here's what we're talking about. Um, today as far as a, a brief overview and then uh, we'll have a couple quiz uh, questions in the middle as well and uh, yeah we'll mix in some uh, answers at the end too we'll stay on the line for that so overall uh, what we're talking about here if you're new to snow and ice melt as a concept that we are melting snow on a surface um, outside obviously it's very similar to radiant floor heating except there's no building on the top so we're circulating a warm water or a water and glycol solution generally for a snowmelt system. You wouldn't want to do pure water in a snowmelt system in case the power went out, you could freeze and, uh, and break some things. So that's bad. Glycol is always the way you want to go. We use a network of PEX pipes embedded in the surface uh, to make this a nice heat emitter, a nice consistent heat. And I'll show you that in a few slides uh, as we go through the presentation. So where did we come from with snowmelt? Uh, as early as the 1950s in North America, people were advertising and installing snowmelt systems, except they were doing it a little bit different from a pipe standpoint. So the material was different. They were using a wrought iron pipe that they were actually making a, a you know big web of that. Imagine making a snake shape with wrought iron pipe. Uh, that's pretty hard to do without having a bunch of leaks. Um, the bigger issue is that the concrete, the additives in the concrete would attack that metal. So those systems didn't last very long. There are some good pictures in the, the uh, advertisement on the slide there. Uh, those were a little bit short-lived and the reason was because the concrete wasn't appropriate for the material use. So now we use PEX, which is better because it isn't something that the concrete goes after and these systems last a really long time. So. The primary benefits of SIM are convenience and safety. Uh, the idea is that you don't have to have the plow truck uh, drive up your scary driveway like I've got on the, the slide there. Uh, it's not bumping into things. And then a bigger driver for a lot of people is slip and fall safety. So especially in the United States, there's not a way to prevent someone from suing you. But if you have a very icy you know, retail space in a um, high altitude environment, uh, that may be a place that people will take a fall walking out of your store and then come after you um, for the injuries sustained. So there's not a way to prevent that, but definitely if we've got some nice traction on you know, wet concrete instead of ice right outside of a door, that would be a, a much better way to go. So those are the main drivers. Um, I get a lot of questions and some of the, the pre show questions today were about operating costs. There may be some scenarios that it's less expensive to have a hydronic snowmelt system than to pay someone to shovel it. Uh, it probably depends on the hourly rate of that person shoveling or how much it would take to get a truck to drive there or how much salt you're using. There's some other things there. If the, the plow driver keeps driving into your mailbox, there are some other considerations there. I would say that's not a primary factor. If your number one decision factor is I need to save money, snowmelt's probably not the way to do that, but it can really alleviate some other problems, safety and convenience being the main drivers there. 
So the primary benefits we're avoiding the use of the chemicals and the salts. So the pictures here, that center picture, there's a big you know, bucket full of salt right there. People are gonna track that in on their shoes all over the carpet, then it melts inside and you've got that kind of pool of blue liquid that's in the lobby. That's not great. Um, the other thing is it can break up the concrete a little bit. So the bottom right slide shows concrete that has been kind of attacked by the use of chemicals. It can kill the grass on the side of the uh, sidewalk there. So those are some disadvantages. And then also you don't uh, have big piles of snow on the slab if you're snow melting it. So you just kind of let that uh, turn to water and then drain it off the side, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail how you do that in the presentation. And it's quiet. We had a, a case once that the people that had the condos above this area uh, just didn't want to hear the trucks. They didn't want to hear the beep, beep, beep of the, the plow in the middle of the night moving the snow. So that was actually a, a primary driver for them. So um, one of the things that I want to mention at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we get a lot of questions about glycol. This slide always makes me think of it. So there's actually a full presentation, a Coffee with Kalefi that was done probably a couple years ago that was called uh, Glycol, that uh, colorful hydronic fluid. That's gonna be a great resource if you've got deeper questions about how, what percentage of glycol, uh, propylene glycol is what we're using most of the time. Sometimes people have creative questions about that. Uh, I would say a good range is 20 to 60% uh, glycol. I would also, just ask you to check with whoever is supplying the glycol and get a better number for your region because it is a thermal efficiency penalty to go with that higher number. Um, you could definitely do 60% glycol in every snowmelt system ever. Um, it would be completely overkill most of the time. So you would wanna check with whoever sells your glycol to get the right number, right percentage. Sometimes it's even the right color for your jurisdiction. You can't use blue or you can't use pink. Uh, so there's a whole nother webinar about that that would be good to answer a bunch of those questions in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the guide for the information that you're going to see in this presentation is from the ASHRAE handbook. So there's a technical committee that talks specifically about snow melts. It's technical committee 6.5. They updated some of the SIM, uh, that's what we call snow and ice melt recommendations as of 2019. I believe it's chapter 51 in the ASHRAE handbook. So that's gonna be the basis of a lot of the information that I'm sharing here. And also what is behind the scenes for the you know, proper design software. So that's the, the information that's pulled into that. One notable thing there is even though it was updated in 2019, the charts that actually show historical weather data did not change in this recent update. That they're probably, you know, I just taking a guess at it, you know, they probably need an update and maybe they're a couple percentage points off. Um, it's a very old data set. I think it was like uh, 92, might have been some of the last data there. Um, it's still useful. So at some point they may update that with, you know, 2025. 20, weather data, but for right now it, it covers um, what you're looking for and there isn't a new data set for that yet. So just a little bit of background there. Um, and then this information from the ASHRAE handbook helps you size your system. So it helps you figure out how many BTUs per square foot we're looking for. And the update to that chapter this year, really what they changed for 2019 is their kind of advocating for more realistic recommendations for the systems that you're designing. So in the past, you may have looked at the handbook and found that, okay, well, I could do 400 BTUs per square foot in Baltimore. Uh, that's not necessarily a practical or realistic application. That's how much you know energy from a physics standpoint it would take to melt that snow. Uh, it's maybe not achievable in some cases. So the recommendations in the 2019 update are more, uh, to avoid oversizing than they are big changes in historical snowfall numbers or anything like that. Okay, so the first thing that you wanna do when you're designing a system, step one, where are you? So if you're looking to do a snowmelt system in Tallahassee, Florida, um, you probably don't need to do that. <laughs> if you're looking to do a, a snowmelt system in Aspen, Colorado, or in, you know, at a ski area somewhere, that's, that's gonna be a good site for snowmelt. 
it's also going to help estimate how many how many BTUs per square foot that you need. So that's a key place to start. Not all snowmelt systems are going to be the same depending on your region. Next, what we're going to cover in the next couple slides, is it okay for snow to build up on a slab? And we kind of put that into a number, an area, uh, for a snow-free area ratio. So if you have a helipad, that is a very different thing than if it's a secondary entrance to a residence that's a, a guest house. Uh, those are completely different scenarios for the acceptability of snow building up. A helipad needs to be clear all the time. Uh, that secondary entrance maybe does not. So the last step here, and these are just general steps, is how is the uh, heated slab going to be constructed? We've had some cases where uh, in like an airplane hangar application, they were going to pour an 18-inch slab and wanted to put snow melt in there, but they were going to put the pipe at the bottom of that slab. Um, it may work one day, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. So that's something that's important to note is how is the slab constructed? Most of the time we're talking about a you know, four or six inch slab, but we do want to make sure we know where the PEX is going to be in that slab because you basically have more R value above the slab depending on how it's constructed. And that's important to know for the design software. So the area free ratio that I was talking about on the last slide, a number one is going to be shooting for, these aren't you know, absolutes with any of this for snow melt, but a number one, 1.0 is gonna be no accumulation during snowfall, helipads, ambulance entrance. Uh, 0.5 is pretty normal, so that's a little bit of snowfall is acceptable. It's gonna depend on the storm. So everything that we're doing here is based off of historical data. We can't predict the future and know that there's going to be a 36 inch snowstorm next year and uh, you might get some accumulation during that event. That's just based on, you know, probably a 10 year data set of numbers there. And then a point zero is an area that can accumulate snow and then eventually it melts out. So it might be an hour later, it might be three hours later. Uh, eventually you need it clear, but it's not going to stop an ambulance from getting into the, the space. So that's kind of how that works. That's one of the factors that we use in the, the chart that I'll get into here. So this is from the 2019 ASHRAE handbook. It's a little confusing looking at it to start with, so I'll kind of break down how we're going to do it. On the left, you see locations. You're probably not going to see your exact city here um, in the ASHRAE handbook and in design software. You're probably going to see the airport closest to you and then other major cities. So if you live in a city near uh, Albuquerque or Amarillo, Texas, use that. Uh, there may be some local designers that have their own spin on that and say, yeah, that's at uh, 4,000 feet and this job site's at 5,000 feet, so we're going to change these numbers a little bit. That's kind of where the art comes into snowmelt, that there are people that have done this for a really long time and know the difference between Vail Valley and the top of Vail Mountain as far as the recommendations you would make there. So first is the city on the left. Next, that snow-free area ratio that we just talked about, uh, one, you know, zero through one there. And the last piece over here is going to be the frequency distribution. So this is the percentage of snowfall hours targeted to keep pace with uh, based on historical weather data. So the 100% number is every single storm from 1982 to 1993 um, that you would be able to cover every storm that happened in the past. Again, it's not a, a looking glass into the future, but that would have covered all of them. 100% uh, as a general statement is a pretty unachievable number. So we generally will stay in the you know, 95 or lower range because it's, uh, it's definitely a promise you wouldn't want to make as a designer or as an installer that 100% of the time you're going to have an area free ratio of one. Probably won't happen. There may be some storm someday that would that would be outside of that. As a rule of thumb, 150 BTU hours, BTUs per hour per square foot is the recommendation that we would make. We've done more. I'm sure that everybody on the call who has snowmelt experience uh, probably has a story where they went over that number. That's the best general statement that we can make. Um, and as far as what I talked about before is achievable, that's a, a good rule of thumb, but we can kind of cover specific examples here. So example A would be a, and that's all the blue boxes. So a residential driveway um, with a snow-free ratio of 0.5, 90% of the historical storms planned for in Texas. 
So we are looking at 88 BTUs per square foot, well within our range, uh, achievable, that's a, that system is going to be okay as far as this design criteria goes to you know, be confident that you've got the ability to make that happen. Now, if we look at a shipping ramp with a, you know, you can never have snow accumulate on this ramp of 99% of historical storms, we're looking at 242 BTUs per hour. So that's a very big system that may not be achievable. That would be something that you would want to basically adjust your expectations is <laughs> kind of the, uh, the conversation that's supposed to happen at that stage. Um, there, you can put warmer fluid and tighter pipe spacing and kind of get above those numbers a little bit, the 150 BTU per hour per square foot. Uh, a better route would be to adjust your expectations and say, okay, there may be times that in that 99% of the storms were okay in that crazy once in a decade storm, we might have some snow accumulate and that's, that's realistic. So this is a technical bulletin that we put together to help you sort through that a little bit better because you could skin this cat a, a million different ways. So some of the applications, you know, the first one there, private residence, sidewalk steps, you want to do either a 0.5 or a 1 because it's a, an entrance and then we're looking at 75 to 90% there. It will melt eventually, but this isn't a helipad and you might not be able to do that with the amount of BTUs per square foot. So that's in that, that technical bulletin that's um, on the Reha website. So slab construction, uh, one of the, the basic ways to do this um, is basically to make a bucket with foam insulation and pour the concrete in it. So um, one of the questions that we get all the time is, do you need insulation for a snowmelt system? And I've got two answers. The first answer is yes, period. And then the second answer is, well, it depends. It depends on the area. It depends on um, if you're okay with buying a bigger boiler because the sizing is gonna be different. We really want to make the path of you know, least resistance uh, you know, clear to get to the top of the slab from the pipe. We want to have a low R, R value there and we want to have a high R value everywhere else. So if you're not trying to melt snow to the left of the slab in this picture, um, then you should have insulation there. So that's uh, something that I know that there are people that will do to shave costs out of a job, not do insulation or do perimeter insulation and a little bit of a you know, border inside and leave the middle part of the slab uninsulated. You can do all those things. You're going to be looking at potentially a bigger boiler and for the rest of the life of the system, it's going to be more expensive. So I would say that that's a pretty safe statement to say that spend the money up front. Um, it will make a better end product for the eventual owner of that property to have a slab that responds a little bit quicker because it was designed well with insulation all the way around. And without insulation, 10 to 30% is going straight back down into the ground. We want to minimize that. Okay, so the next uh, portion here, installation techniques. I like this photo again here. You can see at the end of the lines here, if you can see the mouse on the screen that you're looking at, um, there's a little bit of a light bulb look at the end of these runs. So if you've got six inch spacing, you're using three quarter inch pipe. That's the best way to do that to avoid uh, kinking it. Um, the pipe, if you make, uh, you know, try and make a four inch bend there, you might kink the pipe. A uh, better way to do that is to do that light bulb and then come back to the six inch spacing, you know, 18 inches later, especially if it's cold. So you can see in this photo, it looks like they're dressed for a cold day. That's gonna be the best way to, to work with the pipe there. Okay, so um, I think that we can do a poll question here. I think I maybe went one slide too far. Do you want to do the first uh, poll of the, the day? Yeah, that this will work. So um, there's a question. We'll do this uh, quickly here. Um, if you're going to design and install a snowmelt system on your next project, what would be the reason? Yeah, for sure, safety is number one, 43%. Convenience, reduced maintenance uh, in the 20% range and other four. So safety, okay. yeah, that's the, uh, that's the driver. Okay, great. That's good to know. And then one of the other things that I'll cover too um, at this point is we had some questions come in about maintenance. So what type of maintenance is required for a snowmelt system? Basically, any boiler should be serviced once a year. Um, that's something that I would say just as a former uh, boiler 
uh, rep, that that's a good way to go. For the actual snowmelt specific considerations, what you'd wanna look at is the percentage of glycol in the system and make sure it's what it's supposed to be. So if that has you know, started at 30% and it's diluted down to 15, uh, catch that and make sure that you put uh, more glycol into that system and make sure that you get up to the right percentage number there. Um, and you want to look at the pH. So if your uh, glycol is getting really acidic or something like that, that would be an indicator that you want to make a change there. It's a little different than a solar application or something where the glycol could actually burn and uh, you lose some of the properties there because this is all low temperature. It's not going to have those considerations. But those are a couple things to look for. Another thing to mention there is uh, another absolute statement that I would like to make is don't use just a, a normal you know, water boiler feed with a snowmelt system because if you do have a leak, you're just gonna dilute your glycol down to nothing eventually. Um, a better way to do that would be to have you know, a glycol feed um, with the proper mixture. If you do have a leak, best case scenario, you fix the leak if you can find it. But that way, if you lose a drop of 30% glycol mixture, you're adding a same you know, consistency, same liquid so you're not diluting that to the point that it could freeze. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind with glycol is that the heat capacity of glycol is not as good as water. So the lower you can keep that percentage, the better for the system sizing and the pump sizing because it's a, it's a thick, you know, oily liquid at those high percentages to move around. So that goes back to the glycol statement from earlier. Okay, so back to this slide. Concrete surfaces are the, the traditional way to do snow melt. This is the most common. So you're gonna do the foam insulation and then uh, for structural reasons, you use the wire mesh or rebar and then you can tie to that or do foam staples is a really popular way to go. That's a good way to go fast. Typically we're talking uh, five eighths and three quarter inch pipe. Uh, there are some cases where you would use different sizes but that's probably gonna be the, the middle of the bell curves there. Nine inch spacing is common, and then you definitely want to use oxygen barrier pipe for your system. Um, and that's kind of uh, not so much related to the pipe as it is to the boiler components and ferrous components elsewhere in the system. Okay. So the uh, rest of the, the slide here, so what you want to do is keep the pipe from about two to four inches from the top of the slab. Like I talked about before, if you're pouring an 18 inch slab, you wanna be still in that upper two to four inches. So there are ways to just kind of build a rebar structure that brings that pipe closer to the top. In the picture here, um, you're in good shape because that's just not a very deep pour there. Another thing that you can do with snowmelt is paving stones. This is a pretty popular way to go, I guess, for decorative reasons that people like the look of the pavers, the paving stones more than uh, traditional concrete. Uh, so what you do there is you've got a sand bed or stone dust or something like that, that you put the pipe in and then you put the, the pavers on top of that. This looks nice. It's not my favorite way to go. I prefer the concrete that you can put a color in and then stamp it. So it actually looks like a paving stone, but you still have your pipe embedded in the thermal mass because with the pavers, you've just added a bunch of, you know, an R value on top of that and you have to melt snow through the cold brick first so it can slow down your, uh, your response time a little bit. One of the questions, I took this slide out because it's not my favorite way to do it, uh, was about uh, asphalt. You can do a snow melt system under an asphalt surface. Uh, the best way to do that is you actually have to fill the pipe with water or with water and glycol and keep it cold. So you might need a chilled water source. So I don't think it's quite as realistic as the other options as far as installations go. There are times that we've done it, but you wanna keep it under pressure and keep the pipe from melting basically with the hot asphalt pour. So paving stones are good. Best case scenario would be the concrete. Um, and the reason that people like to do snow melt under pavers is so they don't beat them up with a shovel or a plow or whatever. So this is an example from a casino in Niagara Falls that was a perfect application for snow melt because it was right by the, the misty falls there and it was just kind of an icy mess without snow melt. So with these you know, stairs and the pavers, it was a great fit to keep people from slipping, falling right outside of the casinos there. But again, paving stones may require more energy than just a concrete pour. 
So the answer I had before, uh, use insulation. Uh, there are arguments for specific cases not to use insulation. It will work. It's just going to be more expensive um, and it's going to be a little bit slower response time if you don't have the insulation. It'll be less expensive the first day. Every single day from then on, it's going to be more expensive to operate that system. So drainage, this is actually one of the things that we talked about most in the kind of pre-webinar uh, run through this presentation. So if you just melt the snow on a perfectly flat surface, what you have is a lake. So what you want to do is have a way for the, the snow that you're melting to get off of that slab, to get into a trench drain, into a floor drain, and physically move off of that area. Uh, otherwise, you have to not just melt the snow, but evaporate it. And that takes a lot more time and a lot more energy to do that. So best case scenario is you take that, you know, snow that's at 31 degrees, melt it to 33 degrees, and then get it off of the slab. The drains are a good way to go. A couple considerations there for a big trench drain is that you don't want to design it in a way that you're going to have to run your pipe through the trench drain. That may be something that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't seem like it would be an issue to start with. Some people will go down under the trench drains. The best way to do it is to go parallel to the trench drain and definitely pay attention to where your manifold is located so you'll be able to do that. So if you have a drain that basically isolates a corner of your installation, you'd want to figure out a way to get pipe to the other side of that without crossing the, the drain. Um, the other thing is when I get into the pipe patterns, you definitely want the warmest fluid from your manifold, so the beginning part of your supply to go by the, the trench drain, because if that's the coldest part of your slab, you may build up a little bit of an ice dam right at the drain, which is definitely not what we're looking for there. So get the pipe parallel right to the side, the warmest pipe, that's the, that's the best recommendation for a drain there. So along that, along those lines, if you look at this layout here, if your trench drain was either on the bottom of the slab that I've drawn or on the right, that would be a good spot for it. If it was on the, the left side, that's going to be the coldest fluid going at that point. And it's not, you know, it's not like it's uh, ice cold anymore, but it is not as warm as the supply temperature. That might be a little bit of an ice dam for your uh, system. Uh, one of the guys that I worked with in Colorado who was definitely a snowmelt ace, uh, Greg Burney with Ferguson, actually had a job that he had a sensor that was installed basically in the coldest part of a loop, and it wasn't melting very well. And additionally, I think the concrete people pulled the pipe away from the sensor a little too far, so there was a big pile of snow on top of the sensor, and it wasn't ever really melting out. What he did, which I thought was really creative, is he just switched the supply and the return at the manifold in the garage, and then it reversed the flow and it actually melted the sensor out because it was the sensor was closest to the hottest water now. So that's kind of a tip to have uh, in your in your uh, tool belt, I guess, if you're trying to troubleshoot a snowmelt slab. Because once that concrete is poured, you don't have as many options. I thought that was a really creative way to go. Another uh, example here. This is a scenario where maybe you take the warmest fluid. Uh, in these four circuits to the outside perimeter of the slab um, and kind of straight up the middle into the outside there. Uh, another way to do that, which takes a little bit of getting used to the first time that you do a counterflow spiral, it can be a little bit harder to draw for designers as well. Uh, but this is a, the reason that this looks familiar is it's like an old electric range. This is a very consistent heat because your hottest and your coldest fluid kind of track next to each other and the middle is going to be, in the very middle will be the, the warm point um, and then coming back it cools down, but uh, you do really consistent melting that way. Another big advantage with this is that you are not making as many 90 degree turn or as, as many 180 degree turns. So I'll back up a slide here. That's a lot of 180s. Uh, that's a lot more fasteners potentially because especially at the end of the loop there you need more fasteners where if you're just doing a 90 degree turn it's a little bit easier to work with a uh, pipe on a cold day and you don't need as many fasteners so in this case you're only doing two full 180s uh, which can speed up the process as soon as you get the hang of uh, doing the counterflow spiral and there's a picture of one in in the real world 
Another thing that is not on the set of plans necessarily, but is very important is anytime you're transitioning out of a slab, you want to use a PE a protective sleeve or a bend guide. So anytime the pipe is physically coming out of the concrete slab, you wanna have something to protect it there because as the temperature cycles, um, it can create kind of an abrasive edge on the end of the concrete there. Uh, and the best, best practice is to have a transition out of that so the pipe as it expands and contracts is kind of rubbing against another plastic instead of sharp concrete. Uh, that's definitely a good way to go. So manifold locations. This is probably, if I ask the team of designers at, at Rayow, this is one of the things that we deal with the most. Uh, the central manifold locations are great. It makes it easier to do the design. If you've got a rectangle and can put it kind of right in the middle of the edge of the rectangle, that's a good way to go. Uh, in other cases, it is a good strategy to do a smaller remote manifold. Let's say it's the end of a long driveway and you take a pre-insulated pipe to that. So there are products that you can run a pre-insulated line, supply and return to the manifold that's you know 100 feet away from the house and start there. That's a good way to go too. Uh, the longer circuit may require larger pipe. And the bigger issue is depending on where your manifold location is, you may end up with more of a, a pump than you had planned for, uh, depending on the head loss considerations of the, the manifold and the diameter of the pipe and the loop lengths there. So as far as other location recommendations, accessible is important. You don't want to bury this under the, the landscaping and plant a tree on top of it or anything like that in case you need to uh, isolate something that has a leak or you need to uh, make some sort of adjustment to the balancing when you do that step of the process. Those are important things to look at. Uh, you, as a general statement, don't want to exceed 10 circuits per manifold. You'd probably break that into two different manifolds on different sides of the slab, and that's a good way to go. The last one here in green is in green because it comes up the most. Uh, if the installing contractor decides the morning of that they actually kind of like the look of the manifold on the other side of the slab, that completely changes everything as far as the layout and the potentially even the pipe sizing, definitely the pump sizing in some cases. So it's important that um, when you look at a design, start with where the manifold will be and confirm with whoever you need to talk to that that is an okay space to use, that that's not going to move because basically it's a redesign um, from the drawing layout if you move a manifold and if you have a floor drain that you need to account for something like that, it's good to start with a just a definite location for the manifold and it makes the design process go faster. So here are a couple examples of the manifold locations. So a good one is on the left here. So it's a, a little hard to see where the different uh, zones end, but basically the big rectangle on the left is gonna be our good location zone. So manifolds right in the middle, we split, have really consistent uh, pipe patterns for all of the different circuits in this big rectangle. Uh, not a lot of crowding near the manifold. We can keep that from being a hot spot. Uh, so that's a good way to go. So the one on the right will still work. So basically that other zone is this kind of uh, this top uh, like serif like on a, a letter at the top there. And then this full walkway down to this small uh, kind of golf club looking thing in the bottom right. So this manifold is way up at the top right there. That means we've got a lot of what we call uh, tails going to the golf club part of the, you know, the face of the club down at the bottom. We've got a lot of crowding in this hallway. So this is way more pipe than we need to effectively melt the snow. We just physically need to get all of those different circuits down into the bottom section here. Uh, a better way to go in this scenario would have been if we could have put the manifold like in a closet down closer to the, the golf club face. And that would have made a little bit more consistency uh, achievable for the, the layout of the pipe there. So again, they'll both work, but manifold location is definitely something we spend a lot of time looking at and figuring out, hey, can you go back to the general contractor and see if we can move that manifold here? It's gonna make our, our lives a lot easier. Um, you can also, with the hotspots that I mentioned, um, that can be an issue that you can, if done poorly, you can create a hotspot in the slab in a way that it actually cracks the concrete. Nobody, nobody wants that. So, okay, manifold boxes. Uh, this is actually at our property in uh, Leesburg at our 
uh, Rayhow campus. This is a, a manifold cabinet that we made like a decorative stone encasement around it. So it doesn't have to look ugly. Uh, and then that's a good way to be able to get into the manifold there because we didn't have the option to put it inside of the building right there. But basically we want to protect the pipe uh, and make sure that someone doesn't bump into that manifold with a, you know, whatever, a golf cart or something. Um, and then you can adjust it there as well. So next, I'm going to get into a couple application examples, some different uh, great fits for snow melts. So there may be some of you that aren't in mountain locations on the call. Uh, I would say the best application is a car wash. If it gets cold enough to be freezing, a car wash is a good fit because it may not be snowing, but if you've got a wet car that's dragging water out onto a surface that's 20 degrees Fahrenheit, that's going to freeze and you're going to end up with a lot of ice there. So car washes are a great fit anywhere it gets cold enough. Um, and then the other applications here, best case scenario, transportation hubs, uh, airport entrances, train platforms, that type of thing, sidewalks in public areas, parking garages, uh, helicopter landing pads, things like that are a good fit. And then depending on how uh, how much you value not standing in snow at your house, uh, houses are a good fit too, depending on the application. So this is a perfect application for snow melt. This is actually in my uh, hometown of Park City, Utah. You can see the ski runs in the background there. So this lucky homeowner's got a nice big turnaround for cars up at the top of their driveway. They've done a cool thing that they've built this pattern into the slab with a couple different pores and they have different colors of the concrete, I believe. So you can make it look nice without using pavers just by getting creative with the different pores there to give it more of that uh, paving stone look without using pavers. So this is that same slab during the winter. So they've got a nice good turnaround up at the top. That's a convenience thing. This is the exit of that um, slab, so this is a safety thing. So can you imagine driving down that driveway if that's completely covered in ice? You can't even see the road except for the guardrail. This is a great fit for snow melt. So that makes that treacherous driveway a lot safer, a lot easier to see and navigate in the winter. So this is a, a good residential fit for snow melt. This is uh, from the Solaris Town Center in Vail, Colorado. So I mentioned that five eighths and three quarter is traditionally what we're using for a snow melt system. Uh, this is a case where they used half inch pipe. And the reason that they did that is they have a little bit more flexibility, a tighter bend radius that they could actually do a down and back on every tread of the stairs. So they did another pour of concrete on top of this and were able to thread that pipe down and back on each of the stairs so they could melt uh, right close to the surface effectively and they wouldn't do as long a loop there so you wouldn't do like a 500 foot loop or anything with half inch pipe but uh, that's a it's a good fit to downsize your your pipe size there generally we would go with the longer sizes to do uh, the bigger diameters to do longer runs but that's a good fit there this is that same job site i believe this was a design mechanical uh creative solution and i know that rnh mechanical also has done a bunch of the snow melt in this area uh, but what they did here is they actually threaded this pipe up through the stringer of the cantilevered stairs. So when you see this, it looks like floating stairs in Vail, Colorado, but it's completely melted with no chemicals. And that's a pretty awesome uh, application for snow melt. They got really creative and, and made that happen um, to thread that pipe all the way up and through that. I'm sure that took a little while to do that, but just really cool, creative uh, installation there. This Solaris job site is one that I talk about a lot when we do snow melt presentations. Um, and the story behind this, this uh, job site, there were a few different driving factors. So like I mentioned before, this is a very expensive condo complex above these stairs. And the owners did not like to hear the trucks backing up, scooping up the snow. They were you know, kind of roughing up the paving stones and bumping into things. In this part of Colorado, there's it's an expensive part of the state, so they actually had to additionally, it snows so much that they were scooping up the snow, putting it into a truck, hauling it like half an hour down the road to a big parking lot and leaving it there. And I think at one point they even had like a big bladder filled with warm water to melt the snow because they physically had so much snow that they couldn't get rid of it. Um, additionally, they've got the salt 
um, that people are dragging into the nice lobbies of the different buildings. They have people taking slip and falls outside of the expensive jewelry store, you know, whether or not those were uh, actual people, you know, not paying attention or if people were just taking a dive to you know, file a lawsuit. Uh, that's not really my department, but what they decided to do is snow melt a good portion of this entire main street, which is crazy from an energy standpoint because there's a lot of boilers and a lot of BTUs that's required to melt this whole area. But there were so many compounding factors that it was so much better to just melt the snow, no chemicals, and just allow it to go you know, down into the, the drains that they'd established there and a uh, much better solution for everybody involved. So that's one of my favorite big scale case studies. There are a lot of ski areas that use a similar approach. That's a, a good way to go. So another one that's a slam dunk would be any sort of cold area pool deck. Uh, that is going to be a very icy step if you don't have snow melt there. So even if you're shoveling, you've always got a lot of uh, you know water splashing out of the pool onto the, the deck that could potentially freeze. And even if it wasn't icy when you got into the hot tub, it could be icy coming back out. So that's a good fit for snow melt. This is a, on the picture on the left is a, a nice stamped colored concrete version that looks nicer than just a traditional concrete, but you still have the advantage of having the pipe embedded in the thermal mass there. So a little bit faster response time and you protect the pipe compared to paving stones. The photo on the right is another one that I like to talk about because it looks great. It's nice that the this house um, has the snow melt with the stamped concrete. They can back out of that driveway. And then what? They hit the county road that's not plowed. So the good news is that you've got uh, whatever that is, 100 feet to get up to you know 88 miles per hour and try and jump out onto the county road. Uh, the bad news is that at some point the snow melt surface ends and that's something as a designer or as an installer, you have to kind of put on your future vision goggles and see, okay, what is, what's going to happen when they leave this surface? And at this point, if that's sloped down to the county road or whatever that is, you might have a little bit of an ice dam at the bottom of that if the water is melting and then refreezing at the edge. So if you could put a drain there, that'd be awesome. Realistically, I don't know if a drain is possible in this scenario. So something to plan for, figure out, you know, if you're going up a ramp or down a ramp, where you would want that snow melt slab to end so you'd be able to transition into the next uh, piece of driveway that you're gonna hit. So that's something to, to look for. Again, this is great. It's a nice option that at the end of the day, you get onto a dry slab to pull into your garage, but there is that, that snow dam at the bottom. This photo I've shown a bunch of times. This is a great fit. This is a train station, Union Station in uh, Toronto, uh, Ontario. So. Tons of foot traffic, a lot of people you know, potentially dragging salt into the space. So instead they just snow melt the whole perimeter of this building. Great fit. Uh, a lot of people that could potentially walk out and take a first slippery step there coming in and out of the train station, getting on a bus or whatever the case. So great institutional fit for snow melt. Okay, stairs. So best of intentions here. Um, I put room for improvement because it's not wrong what the issue in the insulation on the left is they were putting down the pipe on kind of an angle there on top of that pink foam. The issue is that you want to be as close as possible to the top of the tread of those stairs. So what happened is uh, because it wasn't close, they ended up with a nice landing and a nice landing above that really icy steps because it was melting the water off of the top right by the door and then it was refreezing on the step treads because it that was a cold part of the slab so uh, another thing to keep in mind for that you want to thread it kind of on the tread of the steps like i showed from that solaris job earlier you also want to have the warmest fluid at the bottom because if you use the warmest fluid at the top with your supply you may end up with all of that refreezing on the first step so you want it to be consistently more and more warm as you go down the steps so the last step melts as well. This job site is great. They uh, have done a really nice job of the pipe spacing, looks really professional, really consistent, good application. They didn't just do the ramp, but they actually did the flat part below. So all of that's good. The only uh, recommendation I would make is the insulation. So it was probably cheaper this first day to not use the insulation, whatever the considerations were. Um, it's going to be a, a fairly expensive 
slab to operate without the insulation, have a little bit slower response time. So looks great, but that's that's one thing that I would do differently there. So this is another one, uh, no insulation below. Uh, the reason I put this one here is compared to radiant heat inside of a building, you will physically see where you have gaps in your consistent pipe layout. So in this picture, there is going to be, it will look like someone dropped uh, 10 or 15 snowballs in a row right at the corner where that pipe doesn't get close to the, you can see kind of on the, the six inch mesh grid there. Uh, that's going to be a little snowball that accumulates there. Not enough to stop a car or anything like that, but you will see a string of snowballs there and it will look like there's something potentially wrong with the system. Not a big deal, but the closer you can get to very, very consistent spacing will avoid those types of things. Okay, controls. This is probably the biggest thing that as the the phrase as the word states that you can control so once you do a really consistent pipe layout um, and get all of your sizing right and your design right there may still be times that you say oh man this isn't you know there is a bunch of snow that's blowing down this alleyway onto the slab all the time uh, this is different from what we had planned on somebody you know, built something next door and all the snow is coming off of their roof down onto the slab now something has changed the pipe layout's not going to unless you rip it out, but the control strategy can. So you may be able to work through some of those issues with good controls. So without getting into specific products, I'm gonna go through a few different options for controls and go over the best way to do it and then some uh, uh, other ways that you can control it other than just a light switch. So best option, there are even controls now on the market that use a Wi-Fi feed and can predict when a storm is coming by percentage chance of snowfall from like the national weather data and say, okay, it's gonna snow six inches tomorrow. So we're gonna ramp up the slab early. We know that it is going to snow. We're gonna get that slab a little warm. So when the snow starts falling, that we can take care of it. So it's automatically gonna start. It's also automatically going to stop. So as soon as the snow has been cleared and the sensor that's embedded in the slab is clear of snow, it's going to turn itself off. So that is a way to save some energy. As the nature of the system goes, this is not energy efficient business. This is very different from net zero energy construction inside of a nice tight envelope in a building. This is heating the great outdoors. So we wanna do this as effectively as possible. Best way to do that is with controls. So automatic start is the best way to go. Automatic stop, uh, the fluid temperature can react to the slab temperature so it doesn't overheat. You can also protect the boiler from getting, uh, you, there are some cases that people use non-condensing boilers. I would really not recommend doing that, but good controls can actually do kind of an injection mixing there to make sure that the boiler doesn't condense, uh, but also you're protecting the slab from thermal shock so it doesn't just blast 150 degree water out and hope for the best. It's actually maintaining a consistent warming so you don't crack the slab. That's a, the best recommendation that I can make. So you can also do, save a little bit of money and do automatic start time stop. So some of those are like aerial sensors that you put on your roof. As soon as the snowflake falls on that, it's gonna say, okay, we're gonna start melting now and we're gonna melt for six hours and then turn back off. That is uh, gonna work some days and it's gonna be overkill some days and it's gonna be undershooting other days. So if it's just time-based, um, what you do is you essentially either don't melt it completely or waste a little bit of energy. Um, the worst thing that you can do is halfway melt a slab so everything uh, melts and then refreezes because you've now created an ice skating rink, which is worse than just some fluffy snow to walk through. So you want to make sure you get all that off, but don't uh, waste the BTUs that it just runs forever. Worst case scenario, is manual on and off with a light switch. Um, if you have to do this, at least use like a twist timer switch that'll turn itself back off, get a you know, 12 hour switch or something like that. Uh, I would really not recommend doing manual on off switches. We've had people that have decided to save some money on controls, uh, do a light switch and they will get a very angry phone call from the homeowner the next time they get their gas bill <laughs> because there are some cases that people have used, you know, forgot to turn off the snowmelt system and just have used, you know, thousands of dollars worth of gas and you could basically cook an egg on the slab 
um, because it's been running for, for 28 days before they got their bill or something like that. So I don't recommend that. It's easy to forget, poor energy efficiency, and really isn't the best product to delivered. So automatic start, automatic stop with a Wi-Fi integration is like the absolute best way to do it. So I'll walk through the sequence of operation for two different modes that you can put these controls, these kind of uh, premium controls into these two different modes. So the first one is melt mode. So the way that that works is an outdoor sensor is going to determine if it's cold enough to snow. So if it sees that it's 65 degrees Fahrenheit outside, it's not gonna turn the boiler on ever. If it sees that it's now 28 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's cold enough to snow, and then it's going to start pulsing a little sensor that's embedded in the slab, a little electric element. So if a dry piece of snow falls on top of that, and then the pulsing resistance element melts it, it's now verified that it's cold enough to snow and it's also wet. So that has melted the snow, uh, changes the, you know, the resistance of the sensor there. So it notices like, okay, the ohms resistance is much different now. Must mean that there's moisture on top of this sensor. So then it's going to start the automatic melting mode. The slab temperature is monitored to make sure that it doesn't ramp up too quick and, and crack. And then as soon as that sensor is dry, the melting stops, or you can add a little bit of time and say, okay, after the sensor's dry, go an extra two hours and then turn yourself off. That's a, a great way to go. That is, again, there's nothing really energy efficient about snow melt. You can make the task as energy efficient as possible with good controls and a predictive uh, melting mode is the, the best way to go there. So let's say you have a helipad your control strategy might be an idle mode instead now. So what that means is that below a defined temperature, which is going to be right around uh, freezing, that you're going to turn the snow melt slab on and maintain a specific temperature, even if it's not snowing. So this is this means that your boiler might be on melting snow from you know September through May in a ski town. And uh, so know that that's gonna be a ton of energy used, but if the, the objective is to save lives and have a snow-free helipad, absolutely worth it. So what you're doing next is you're defining how warm you want that slab to be idle. So I would recommend not even necessarily breaking 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You can idle a slab at 28 degrees or you know, check with your designer and the specific conditions that you have, but it's really just to speed up the response time. So you're not going from completely cold system hasn't been on for two weeks to try and melt snow really fast. If you're going from 28 to 32 degrees or 35 degrees or whatever you set your, your melt temperature for, that's going to happen a lot faster. So idling right below the, uh, the freezing temperature is still okay. Some people will uh, maintain an idle mode at 35 degrees all winter and know that that will be a ton of energy, but it will start melting every snowflake that lands. We had a an oil and gas uh, billionaire who designed a slab or designed a house and he said he wanted snow to melt three feet above the slab <laughs> and uh, not really achievable. Uh, some people have different uh, different ideas of how they want their system to work. That was something that he wanted to do, you know, full idle, never a, a drop of snow on the slab. Uh, you can do that. I wouldn't recommend it. And it, it isn't even really better than the, the controls that see us storm coming and can ramp up in enough time. That's the best way to go. So critical snow-free zones are where you would use an idle potentially. Okay, so the sim zoning, without going into a ton of detail here, every different physical zone that you're melting should have a sensor. So there are some cases where people say, well, where do I put the sensor? I've got two completely different areas. And the best answer is two different sensors because in this case, you've got a small area on the north side of the building, uh, non-critical walkway, completely different criteria uh, than the one on the east side of the building that's the main driveway. So you will, if you use a single sensor, you're going to overdo it or underdo it with one of those slabs. So you may melt zone two perfectly and zone one is so hot that it cracks the, the slab eventually and we don't want that. So the best way to do it, it's going to be a little bit more expensive because it's another set of controls, but best practice is a, a sensor in every different slab. Sensor locations. You want to do uh, in the actual heated surface, which probably is self-explanatory, but um, we have had some cases where people are holding the sensor in their hand uh, after the, the concrete's been poured and uh, you don't have as many options at that point. You could do a uh, automatic start 
time stop, like a roof mounted sensor or something instead. But uh, best case scenario is it's actually in the middle of the, the slab like that between the, the loops of the pipe. Sensor locations, this could probably be a two hour argument between seasoned designers for where you put this. Uh, basically, you want to make sure that it's level with the finished slab is a good recommendation there, that it's not in a, a divot or you know three inches above the slab. So level is the best recommendation for this sense. And then you want to take conduit to the edge of the slab in case you ever did need to bring a new sensor and somebody dropped a hammer on it, whatever, you can have the ability to pull a new wire, uh, which is important. Locations to avoid under a roof. If it doesn't actually get snow, it's not going to know when to turn the snow melt system on. Um, so there is a, definitely a lot of debate about do you put it right under where you expect to park the car, right next to where you expect to park the car. If it's under the car, it's not going to notice that it snowed. Um, but if you're dragging slush in a wheel well out of a garage and parking on top of it, then it may turn on better there and melt the snow. So there, I don't have a perfect answer for that, but uh, make sure that essentially it's not protected by something so it actually gets natural snowfall. Okay, this is what I described before. So no room for drainage, and now you have a little bit of an ice rink there. So it's gonna take a long time to melt that, that snow and then uh, evaporate all the liquid as opposed to having a drain. Okay, so for um, this, I think that we had another poll and then I'm gonna do kind of a lightning round for different boiler piping examples. Um, so do you guys wanna start the, the last poll? Who you ask to design your next snowmelt pipe layout? Engineer, manufacturer, the rep, distributor, or you do your own design? Yeah, so this looks split uh, 28, 29%, either an engineer, or I do my own designs, 5% uh, okay. distributor, uh, manufacturer, rep, and manufacturer, 18 and 19%. So that's, you know, I would say the people in the snowmelt specific areas of the country, like you were talking about in Colorado, probably want to have a hand in their own design. Yeah. You might need an engineer's stamp on it. Okay, great. Well, I'll do the uh, the bonus round here with the piping uh, diagrams. So the one that's on the screen here, this is a dedicated boiler. So the only thing that this is doing is snow melt. So there's no domestic hot water. There's no space heating. This is a boiler that was sized for the snow melt slab. And then also the pumps are sized for that. You've got closely spaced T's or a hydro separator potentially. And then you can see just the visual representation, of a little bit bigger pump there because like I talked about before this glycol, is thicker than water um, so you might need more of a pump there and again that uh, the glycol percentage will affect boiler sizing too because the heat capacity is different than pure water so um, a couple things here you're going to use the same glycol mixture throughout uh, you don't have to have a different percentage in the house and a different percentage outside so that's helpful one consistent thing um, you don't bog down your house so if your snow melt is running and you're also, you know, everybody just came back from skiing and a bunch of showers are starting, you haven't bogged down your house uh, with the snow melt system. So there's a separate boiler. Uh, there's no additional heat exchanger here. It's just the heat exchanger of the boiler. You don't have a flat plate or anything. Uh, one uh, tip that I would give to the engineers that are on the call, please don't put these boilers outside. <laughs> you, may be, um, you may be in a situation that you wanna save some of the space or the architect does inside of the house. Uh, if you have a broken down snow melt boiler that's covered in four feet of snow, that's, uh, that's not helping anybody out for just to make a plug for the contractors in the room there. So another way to do it is a shared boiler. So this boiler is set up that the top manifold may be radiant heat inside of the building and then at the bottom, you've got a heat exchanger, a flat plate that's going out to the snow melt system. So you've got two separate uh, loops, basically. The snow melt system may have, just as an example, 50% glycol. And then inside the house, you may have no glycol or 20%. So that's a good way to separate the, the glycol percentage. You don't need to run 50% glycol through your whole house. Please don't do that. There's a, there's a better way to do it. Um, and check to make sure you've got the right percentage with your, your glycol people as well. So some advantages there, a small mechanical room, you only have one boiler there, you don't have a separate dedicated snow melt boiler. Uh, you split the glycol with the heat exchanger, you've got the hydro separator to do the separation because you'll have different flow considerations if you've got space heat on and no snow melt. Um, you've got the closely spaced T's primary secondary effect there. 
and then uh, this may be something that could slow down your response time though so that's something to keep an eye on if the snow melt zone is you know a quarter mile of a driveway and you turn that on that may bog down the house a little bit to bring back 14 degree uh, fluid to the right side of the heat exchanger there so something to keep an eye on there are some cases where they have to kill the snow melt when they're trying to do domestic hot water uh, that's no fun so in that case a dedicated boiler might be a good way to go look for something with a really big turn down ratio for a boiler here so you'll be able to do a little trickle of space heat and then ramp way up for snow melt if that's the case Okay, so a couple of photos I'll go through fast because we're right at the top of the hour. This was a job site that I worked on. Uh, one of my buddies in Colorado, Mark Fryer, did this really big condo complex uh, to, I think they were both 1.5 million BTU boilers. And then in the background there, you can see a Delta P pump. So that's a great application because as you first start that system, that even potentially slushy fluid at 14 degrees Fahrenheit is gonna be really hard to move. But then if you've got a consistent pressure um, setting on that pump, as it starts to warm up and get a little bit, the viscosity goes down a little bit, it doesn't have to work as hard. So then the pump can slow down a little bit and you're still maintaining the delta T that you need for the boiler, but it doesn't have to you know, work in the, the most you know, uh, difficult conditions all the time. And then on the wall of the photo on the right, they've got a hydro separator up on the, the wall there that's a, a good fit, uh, nice support for the, the big hydro separator for both of those boilers because you might have one boiler on, both boilers on, uh, different modulation rates, so that makes sure that you've got the good uh, separation there. With these photos, so the hydro separator on the left, kind of like the, the last arrangement, and then on the right, there's an air and dirt separator. So the reason that it's important to go with the, a big volume air and dirt separator or hydro separator here is that because that glycol is such a thick, like almost like a motor oil uh, fluid, especially when it's cold, you need a big area to be able to effectively separate air. So if you did just a little scoop style air separator, you may never get the air out of that solution. It probably won't ever move slow enough and have uh, like that big wide spot in the river like you get with one of these separators to be able to separate the air out of it. So that's a, definitely something I would recommend is a, a big high quality air and dirt separator to help with that system because the glycol is, is difficult to work with. The only thing that glycol is good at is not freezing. <laughs> Other than that, it's uh, more difficult to work with than, than pure water in a system, but uh, you can't have it freeze, so. I think we're, yeah, that's it. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks again, Max, and uh, stay warm. Yeah, bye thanks bye. for having me.